between the participant and the stressors, right? What are the conditions that led the participant to perceive the stressors in the way it's very hard to uh, sort of, and that's what I'm saying, there is no, I, to my knowledge, research in conflict theory that talks about this, right? The cognitive relationship between external stressors and the internal processes of your mind, right? How, what's that relationship? Uh, I would love someone to, you know, do that research, right? What is that relationship, right? So what's important then, and I'll put an asterisk by it, is identifying, right? Not just identifying the stressors, and that's what one is. Not just identifying the stressors, but the, but you identifying as researcher the relationship between the participant's cognitive mode of processing those stressors and why that led to some action X, right? So um, you know the boss, uh, something cliche right off the top of my head. The boss was you can imagine um, you're doing organizational conflict and um, you want to interview employees who with actually this would be I think pretty this is off the top but it, I think it'd be good research actually I think this would be great research that's too my own horn but when you have this in your head it's like you can you can apply it immediately to what I think would be sort of novel research I'm not saying that this is but I think it would be a really cool organizational conflict dissertation to identify participants who quit on the job immediately no warnings no two-week notice um, it's not like they went home and never came back. While they were at work, on the job, at work, something happened and they, and they quit that moment. They left the job that moment, right? Packed up their stuff, blah, 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 and walked out the door. They weren't fired. They didn't give notice. It's not like they came home and then decided not to go back ever again. While they were at work, oh, no, I need to leave now, right? I need to leave now. That would be phenomenal organizational conflict research to identify what stressors could be present in the workplace to have an employee leave at an instant and never return to the job. Let's collect data from those individuals. I would imagine it's a very sort of niche specific group, but could you imagine what the, what the coding process would look like in that research? It would be, that, that would be phenomenal research, right? Organizations would, would pay you a lot of money to consult. Why? Because they would want to know what the conditions were, right? the identification of the conditions that led the employee to quit. And they would make sure that their HR firms and people never allowed those conditions to manifest in their particular organizations. Why? Because if they manifest, those conditions arise in my organization, I read Dr. Campbell's findings, I saw that he did um, uh, cross-cultural, cross-gender, uh, cr cross-social, uh, cross-educational analysis of X number of participants with this criteria being the sole connector, quitting on the job, in the middle of the job, I don't want those conditions to arise in my organization because one of my employees might quit on the job, and I don't want that. I need my employees, right? So, off tangent a bit, I actually don't think it's on tangent, I think it's specifically on point, but you, you, I want you to recognize how important this is, right? Those findings, those generalizable conditions are are amazingly powerful indicators as to the way in which human beings could, not will, we're not sheep, we're not robots, right? The way in which human beings could respond given similar conditions. Since most corporations have a cross-section of people that work for their corporation, it's inevitable that a few of their employees will probably act exactly like individuals in your finding, the company wants to maximize profit, and in order to do that, we need employees. So I want to make sure that my employees have a good work experience. Make sure, HR folks, that these conditions don't arise in my company because I can't afford to lose Bob. I can't afford to lose Mary, and so on. Right? Powerful, powerful stuff. Right? So the, there is a sense in which the way that we deal with this, right, the way that we, being the researcher, deal with this, is really an ethical way of dealing, right? We didn't want, I don't want, our employees should not, right? I don't want this to happen, or I do want this to happen. They should do this. They don't have the resources or sort of the, the, the fortified conceptual training to understand these relationships. These relationships, I mean, this is all I do, so I mean, <laughs> even for me, it gets, it gets heady at times. But they'll be more than willing to pay you in order for you to come in and tell them how 
they should handle their, their business. Why? Because it's a good investment in their business, right? So I don't want you to think that this conceptual stuff is me just writing on the board little stick figures and as no application. This stuff applies big time. Personally, I'm not interested in going out there and doing that consulting stuff. I could. Um, but what I'm at this point in my life, but what I am interested in is getting you to see that this is viable stuff, right? This is viable research. So if you're not just motivated by the sheer conceptual intricacy of all of this stuff, which is what is my my sweet tooth, then at least be motivated by the fact that you can make you can make a good profit, right? You can you can and you can change people's lives, you can go out there and start a consulting firm, you can do a ton of crap, right? And this is not easy stuff to do. You know, John and Jane Doe off the street's not gonna be able to, to do this because there's a lot there's a lot of intricacy in navigating the discourse and being able to identify the stressors and such. So number two, I think that should be clear. clear. Number two, strategic approaches. Um, epistemological strategies are a means of dealing with ethical dilemmas. Epistemological, oh, that's it. Epistemological um, strategies are a means of dealing with ethical dilemmas. This is, in a sense, one through four. Uh, it's a strategy. It's a way of interpreting the relationship between the um, the participant and sort of the life story, right? The stressors. It doesn't have to be stressors in the negative sense, but it's life stories of the participant, right? This is a, there's a structure, right? So it's in the um, as far as I'm concerned, it's in the it's a strategy, it's a strategic approach to assessing the data, which is going to be the story or the narrative that you're going to get from your participants, right? Epistemological. Right? It's an epistemological strategy. It's strategic because we recognize it unfolds in a particular sense. And you know, I'm not writing, um, I'm not writing academic literature on this subject. But you can you can codify this and make it more intricate. I would imagine there's a lot more to it than there's just this. But I have to present this in a way that that's intelligible because this doesn't really exist in literature. Right? It doesn't really exist. It's it's an amalgamation of several different theoretical standpoints in order to, to make it seem as one, one structure. It's not an easy thing to, to compile as an academic for pedagogical purposes. But what, what's the easier part is not the strategic part, but the epistemological part, right? There's a sense in which we already know this, right? What we don't know, though, is the strategy in which we operationalize our knowledge, right? Which is absolutely key. You have a gut feeling, right, that... There have to be, a, in a very sort of colloquial, sort of man on the street, woman on the street sense, yeah, there's a sense in which the stressors at the job, the stressors in the family, the stressors at school, these stressors lead people to excel, or they, they inhibit individuals from excelling. For those individuals who excel, what is their relationship to those stressors? And how do those stressors help them to excel? For those people who have exactly the same stressors present, they don't excel. They cower. They bow. They 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 flee. They why why is it that they do that? The stressor is the same. It's a cognitive thing. There's something in their head in which they process the stressor different, right? And this is this is where it's just it just becomes beautiful. And this is why my research when I do write academic research, I always try to do it from an interdisciplinary standpoint because I want to invite the psychologists to my reading. I want to invite the anthropologists. I want to invite the political scientists and the sociologists to say, hey, well, you know, Dr. Campbell, love your stuff. That's great. But, you know, from my training, from a sociological standpoint, I really think you missed this point. Here's what you could have done, because this also is a way in which human being, wow, cool stuff, right? So it's this overlap. We recognize epistemologically that, holy, this, the, the stressor is exactly the same. But the stressor that Dr. Campbell received helped him to excel. The stressor that Bob received that was exactly the same stressor caused him to, to flee. Why? Why? There's something about the way in which the individual participant processed that information. And for me, this is the frontier for 21st century qualitative methods research, is that. And that I really think personally, and now I'm really biased, um, I really think personally that this is, this is the next huge sort of, this is the next huge publication, um, academic, I don't even know what the words are I'm looking for. It's the next, it's the next new sort of topic of research in quality. It should be, right? An identification of that. And we, and not only are we identifying it, um, within sort of a conceptual armchair 
um, 